Well, George, it's a pleasure to have you back at Penn State. It's uh, just been be wonderful to have you here, and you're bringing your ideas and your enthusiasm for, for the field, and, and what you leave behind is always great, so thank you. Thank you. Um, as you know, we have this program called COIL Perspectives, where we uh, frame a series of questions that we ask uh, experts over a period of time, and then we can kind of compare the, the questions and the responses. So this is 2015. We're starting a new set of questions, and, and this set of questions really is examining uh, faculty and research perspectives on why students uh, might not be learning as effectively or as efficiently as they can. Um, and where we're thinking about this is, well, if we can identify those, perhaps there's something we can do to bring to the table to address that. So the three questions I'd like to present are, uh, have you think about or describe a, uh, an issue, a problem, a barrier that you see for students learning? maybe from your own experiences. Um, and the second is without um, any, any limitations on time or resources, can you create a schema or a product or a thing that can address that? Uh, and then bringing it back to the, the ground level is what can we do as, a, say, a first step toward, toward approaching those? So let's start with the first one. Sure. I know you, you dig into this stuff deeply. And uh, from a variety of different perspectives. So I'm curious as to what, and I know I'm asking you only to identify one, and you probably have 50, but what, what one would might come to mind in terms of a, a barrier for students? Well, I'll cheat a little bit just by saying uh, contextually, there are factors that sometimes are well beyond the control of the student. And mm -hmm. so obviously, poverty is one of the most mm -hmm. significant factors that comes into play. Mm -hmm. And that's where there's a, fortunately, in the US now, at least a lot of interest in how do we help underrepresented students mm -hmm. become more successful. Now, that's something I just want to list as a, as a context. There mm -hmm. are factors. It's not always strictly the volition of a student that determines mm -hmm. their success. So, uh, but specifically in terms of what kinds of activities that students have control over, what do I at least think is one of the most significant factors? I would say it's probably this idea of personal control and ownership. Mm -hmm. And so what I mean with that, uh, I'll go back, way back to the Enlightenment. <laughs> and, you know, Kant, when he was trying to describe or write about what is the Enlightenment, what does it mean to be enlightened? And the art argument or the articulation that he provided was that to be enlightened is essentially to be able to do for yourself what you've previously relied on others to do mm. for you. And I think for a lot of students, that's really a mm. bit of a challenge. I think as, as a learner from the time we get to kindergarten, mm. we've been conditioned a certain way. Uh, we've been taught to look to the teacher for the answers. Mm -hmm. We've been taught that uh, we have to uh, follow the rules that someone else sets for us. Mm -hmm. And so when I look at barriers to learning, I think it's that mindset, it's that self-perception mm -hmm. of what do I do or what should I be doing. And with courses that I've run, I've found at least when I try an experiment or try and do something a little bit different, a little bit more innovatively, that the pushback comes from students in that the pedagogical experience that I've designed for the course isn't matching with their previous encounters mm -hmm. in courses. So they're looking for those cues. Mm -hmm. like, Tell me what I need to know. Tell me when the test is. Tell me what this yeah. assignment is. What do I have to read? Those mm -hmm. kinds of things. And so in a certain sense, I guess I'd like to, to overcome that barrier, for lack of a better term, and to be just only a little bit cheesy. Mm. But it would be nice if we could have a kind of a learning enlightenment revolution mm. as well, where students start to realize that your learning, in some cases, your own views about yourself and your own skills are the biggest barrier to you mm. being a successful learner. So if you're able to take ownership of your own learning, mm -hmm. take control of the technologies and the spaces in which you learn so that your mm. data doesn't go off to some other system and you lose your contributions when you graduate from a university, for example. Mm. I think that would be one of the biggest barriers that I see, at least, especially mm. in an age where in so many other parts of our lives we've got that control. Yes. You go to a grocery store now and you scan and bag your own groceries and pay and yeah. go. You go, uh, I mean, I can't remember the last time I've gone into a bank to directly speak to a teller. You know, right. every, everything, I, I do my banking online, right. I can deposit my checks digitally right. and so on. So it's interesting that while we've gained so much freedom in so many areas mm. of society and personal control, in education, we still have this very heavily reliant relationship. And, and as I mentioned, I think that's a significant barrier. You know, the first thought that came to mind that you were talking about that is how we're taught to color within the lines. Yeah. And uh, what you're describing is, is either loosening those lines or allowing the learner to, to define where those lines are. And they're not too comfortable in doing that. It's just saying when, you, when you've turned that over, they're like, where are the lines? Yeah. But I mean, part of it's too is it's hard to say. So let's say from the time we're in kindergarten until we, the time we graduate high school, we get to university, we've had 12, 13, 14 mm. years if we had preschool worth of conditioning mm -hmm. that has taught us to interact a certain way with, uh, with uh, faculty sure. and teachers. 
remember when I was teaching at Red River College, I taught uh, adult education theory. And so I would have a group of students, I'd observe them in, in, their, in their labs or in their classrooms, and they'd be engaged, mm -hmm. they'd be you know, motivating students, they'd be demonstrating, they were terrific instructors. And I'm thinking, oh, that's a great group of folks. And I'd get them in my class, and the moment I sat down, it's they, they assumed the position yes. of the learner. Like they'd been conditioned. Once they get into that rat maze, they'd been conditioned to follow it through. And so the earlier we can start to, to change that, mm -hmm. that we can start to, I'm not saying do away with the teacher. Mm -hmm. I'm saying re-architect the relationship mm -hmm. between the teacher and the learners, and the learners and the learners, so mm -hmm. that you don't have this hub-spoke model, but instead you have a network. The teacher can still be a critical node or a sure, significant node sure, in the network, sure. but they're no longer the exclusive node. And it, it requires, mm. even as educators teaching, it requires rethinking our own views mm. of our role in the classroom. Right. So, so with that as a, as a framework, how might you see, I don't know, we won't even give it a time frame. No time, no, time, no, no resource limitations. What would it look like for a learner to function in a space like this? Well, first of all, they're obviously they're realizing that learners will progress differently and taking control and ownership of one's own learning is not necessarily, uh, it means it's a stressful process. Mm -hmm. You have sure. to do away with a lot of your, your convenient systems that you're comfortable with in a classroom. So what would it, what would it look like? So I'd say in the future, uh, first of all, in many ways, we do have some models that are, provide sort of an early glimpse. And I just referenced a few, whether it's using the uh, self-service options that we now have mm -hmm. in interacting online and so on. I think essentially it would be a tool set that is uh, multifaceted, mm -hmm. that isn't, uh, and, and well integrates well with additional tool sets. Mm -hmm. So those of you that have been part of a Web 2.0 cycle, you might remember in 2004, 2005, 2006, we were paying a lot of attention to this idea of single functionality tools that are loosely connected. Mm -hmm. So rather than building the big behemoth, the big gigantic uh, software platform that does everything for mm -hmm. us, instead we found, you know what, I'm going to use Blogger that time mm -hmm. and uh, then I'm going to use uh, you know wiki spaces mm -hmm. and I'm going to use this tool <coughs> over here and we stitched our interaction together using RSS at that stage mm -hmm. and RSS has sort of fallen to the wayside and APIs now seem to be a more suitable approach but it, it's that kind of an idea still mm -hmm. it's the sense that you own your own space of learning wherever mm -hmm. you want to learn it doesn't matter when mm -hmm. you come to us as a university mm -hmm. you can come with your own tool sets that you're using in your personal mm -hmm. lives so you don't have to learn yet another software system that, that we own as a system. Uh, and secondly, the university should still provide a series or a range of options mm -hmm. for those students. So mm -hmm. that might, some students might come in and say, you know, I don't have a personal learning architecture. I don't know what you mean by yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's the role university can say, well, here, here are things that you can do or yeah. be involved with. Yeah. So ultimately, I think it's about not necessarily single-handedly creating this suite of tools, mm -hmm. but instead it's about creating uh, an environment and an expectations on students, and, and a, for lack of a better word, a marketplace mm -hmm. where many individuals are creating different tool sets, and then the university becomes the aggregator, if you will, mm -hmm. of those different tool sets and that different functionality. The students can still own the content that they post in a service off campus, but mm -hmm. because and this is where this is quite a critical challenge because the university and the process of learning is typically online, at least very fragmented. You might go to a handful of different sites might go to Wikipedia, you might be on Google Scholar searching for a paper, uh, you might watch a TED talk, take a MOOC, and the list goes on. The challenge though is that learning is a unifying process. And so we have this significant disconnect that when we learn in these free-ranging digital spaces, we're having a very fragmentary learning mm -hmm. process. But learning is actually a sense-making, coherence-making process. So we're a little bit at odds with, with these mm -hmm. two issues. Mm -hmm. and I think the university sits in the middle helping students mm. to unify those various experiences, helping them to understand and to sort of self-actualize, if you will, uh, their, their own learning experience through that. End result then is you mm. have a marketplace with numerous different kinds of mm. tools with the university being the primary integrator that pulls those experiences mm -hmm. together and enables that coherence forming mm -hmm. of concepts and knowledge and ideas. Mm -hmm. Sets the table, but, but a different table than we're working with today in our, in our structure. So if we were to move um, one step further, what, what's a, I, I hate to say low-hanging fruit, but what's something we might do that would start down this path of this, this system you're describing? Well, first of all, I, I do think uh, it's a learning design component mm. it, because you, you almost need to unlearn mm. the way that you learn to relate mm -hmm. to a university or to a school system. Sure. So I think at a basic, a short-term level is to with faculty and learning designers in creating initiatives that are intentionally 
made to spring learners free from okay. the way that they've come mm. to understand the learning experience. From there, uh, and, and mm. that takes time. It's an important thing to recognize. You're, you're having, you're essentially having a, a conceptual or a framework shift. shift so you yeah. can't take a student in a class and say, thou shalt be free. Because yeah. uh, it's not going to work. Yeah. They're going to be yeah. frustrated. They're going to be overwhelmed. And I found this with the MOOC I taught with a few colleagues mm. recently, that we had exactly that experience. Mm. We, we thought, oh, isn't this wonderful? We're going to create this beautiful meadow you can run through and be free. And students instead prefer to cluster around the content that we you know, they expected mm. previously. And it became quite clear that, uh, that we have to do a better job of scaffolding mm. that experience. Mm. So I think a short-term process is exactly that. Work mm. with learning designers and faculty in helping learners gain control of their learning and their spaces of learning. There's initiatives that you know, Jim Groom and others have uh, initiated with on his domain of one's own, which mm -hmm. is sort of reclaiming your spaces of learning. So mm -hmm. even though you might not yet be a fully autonomous, self-motivated, self-actualized learner, mm -hmm. uh, trying to work through all my buzzwords here. <laughs> You're getting them all out. But even though that process is happening, you know, that they're moving mm -hmm. through there, uh, the, the uh, experience still becoming mm -hmm. self realizing that I control my mm -hmm. learning. I'm responsible for the success mm -hmm. of my own learning. It, it's, it's, for lack of a better word, almost like that sort of enlightenment shift. That sure. It, and the great thing I, uh, about that idea is that as I move into the workplace in, my, in the rest of my career, that's how I really have to manage the rest of my life, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Very and good. That's, and when you think of it now, so this is one of the, the challenges I've been trying to articulate from a university lens for folks that I've spoken with over the last several years. But it's... I don't think an overstatement to say that one of the biggest changes that will happen in society within the next decade is what happens with employment. Mm -hmm. And this comes from a range of things, whether it's artificial intelligence, machine learning, or advances in technology, that we're finding that jobs that we in the past perhaps thought were knowledge jobs that were always going to be done by people, also we're realizing we can automate a lot mm -hmm. of things. Folks like Bill Gates and Elon Musk and others have made statements about our AI-centric mm -hmm. future, you know, artificial intelligence will be a factor. Sure. Gates said that within the next decade, up to 50% of the jobs that we're seeing mm -hmm. right now could be done technologically. So what that means then is there's going to be an entirely new range of jobs opening mm -hmm. up, which means that in the next decade, chances are many people even watching this video now will see their job change so mm -hmm. dramatically that mm -hmm. they're going to need to go to rescale, upgrade, or do something different. Mm -hmm. And so instead of now, universities have this mindset that we have our students for four or five or six years. And that's all we have. So we charge them tuition, they're done, then we push them out, and then we interact with them as, as an alumni. What I think will happen mm -hmm. is that instead of now being a, you know, a Penn Stater for four years mm -hmm. and then just having that as an identity marker in your, in your own personal profile, you'll actually have an ongoing, iterative, lifelong relationship, mm -hmm. which means that instead of squeezing your tuition out in four years, you're going to have learners that are going to be with the system for 35, 40 years right. because employment will change. They're going to come back. They're not going to take an entirely new degree, but they might take two months of intensive learning on campus followed by a series of online learning activities that happen throughout right. the year as they rescale. Interesting. And right. they're going to do this instead of for four years, they're going to do this for 30 or 40 plus years. And, and mainly mm. because that's the nature of the economy. And so right. we can't have learners become self learners that are in charge of their own learning engage in that process unless they are in charge yeah. of their own learning. Yeah. So they really yeah. need to have those attributes. Yeah. And it starts with education. Yeah. It starts and ends there. Yeah. It actually continues. Yeah, good. Well thank you so much. It's always a pleasure to have you here. Thank you.